Well, good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Council of the Municipality of North Perth held on Monday, March 2nd, 2020. I'm Mayor Todd Kaysenberg and I'll call this meeting to order. I ask the Deputy Clerk to note our starting time for the minutes is 7 p.m. I invite you all at this time to rise for the playing of O Canada. Tonight's meeting is being streamed live on the Municipality of North Perth YouTube channel and will be available there after the meeting as an archived video. To those present in the gallery today, by attending a public meeting of the Council, you are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded. Anyone who is invited to speak will be recorded and their voice, image, and comments will form part of the live stream. The Chair and or the Clerk have the discretion and authority at any time to direct the termination or interruption of live streaming. Such direction will only be given in exceptional circumstances where deemed relevant. Circumstances may include instances where the content of debate is considered misleading, defamatory, or potentially inappropriate to be published. Attendees are advised that they may be subject to legal action if their actions result in inappropriate or unacceptable behavior and or comments. Thank you. This community succeeds and flourishes when its people make their contributions. Those making important contributions include councillors at this table who will listen to and deliberate on the matters on our proposed agenda. This council has been well supported by dedicated members of the staff of North Perth who provide service and reports to this council and to our community. Further, we are supported by insight from those who speak with us before our council meetings and those who have business with or interest in the work of this council. I appreciate all of you being here and your service. I invite your decorum over the course of the coming meeting. Since our work requires very specific concentration, procedures issued by council requires all but councillors and specific media to turn off electronic communication devices at this time, and even then to respect focus use for our meeting. Use of cameras or audio devices during or to record this meeting is not permitted. Let us move then to item 2.1 of our agenda pertaining to pecuniary interest. For the benefit of those unfamiliar with our council practices, provincial legislation requires councillors with a potential pecuniary or financial interest in any item at the council table to declare this interest and to remove her or himself from discussions and voting on the item. In accordance with recommended protocol at this time, I invite all councillors with pecuniary interest, including those who have declared in writing to verbally advise the chair in public session and to submit documentation to this effect in writing to the clerk. Councillors are further reminded that should a potential conflict arise during the meeting, they may so declare and act at any point in the meeting. Councillors, any of you have anything to declare on this matter tonight? Seeing no indication of same, uh, regarding item 2.2 of our agenda, I have a motion before me for the adoption of the agenda for tonight's meeting. 
and I, I'm going to acknowledge the clerk because I believe there's a change in the schedule. Clerk Bearfels. Yes. Um, tonight we need to remove from your council agenda under the CAO item 5.1.1 the presentation from Laurie Wolf regarding the community transportation project. Thank you. Councillors, please note that change. Anything further that council has on its mind on this one? Okay, I have a resolution for our consideration then that the agenda for tonight's meeting as amended be approved. Could I invite a mover for that? Deputy Mary Kellen, thank you, and Councillor Andreessen. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried. Thank you. That brings us to agenda item three, the so-called consent agenda. These items are placed on our agenda because they are believed to be non-contentious, yet they require council's approval. Grouping them expedites our business. However, any councillor wishing to extract an item from the consent agenda for discussion, debate, or individual action may do so. There are seven items on our consent agenda tonight, including the minutes of the last regular council meeting. Councillors, do any of you have a desire to extract any of these items for discussion or action? Seeing no indication of same, uh, I have a resolution for our consideration that reads as follows. The consent items 3.1 to 3.7 be received for information and the minutes of the February 24th, 2020 regular council meeting be adopted. Could I invite a mover for that? Councillor Anstead, thank you, and seconded by Councillor Rothwell. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried, thank you. And this time it's proposed that we move to agenda item number four. We have um, no public meetings this evening, but we do have uh, two delegations tonight for our consideration. First, it's my pleasure to invite Julia Opie, Perth County's Accessibility Coordinator, who will present an annual report on accessibility to us. Welcome, my friend, Julia. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Kaysenberg and members of Council. Uh, you have before you the second uh, annual status update to the 2018 to 2022 um, accessibility plan. Um, this is a legislated update. We are, we are legislated to produce a five-year plan and then to do annual status updates indicating our progress on meeting the five accessibility standards regulations. So I'm asking for your approval on, um, on this report and, um, and then to uh, post this on the North Perth website. This is also in the legislation. Councillors, any questions for Ms. Opie? Not one question for Julia. <laughs> Councillor Rothwell, thank you. Uh, not a question through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, through to Julia and uh, certainly through to the Accessibility Advisory Committee. I, I would uh, like to think that Council wants to appreciate the work and effort of the uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee uh, on their uh, work and reviews, uh, certainly with a lot of development and so on that we have in terms of site plan reviews. I know it does take a lot of time and effort. So uh, if there's no other questions, I just want to make sure that, uh, uh, Julia, you can uh, relay uh, Council's appreciation for the Accessibility Advisory Committee because it is uh, we do have representatives from North Perth that have historically been on there and certainly appreciate their work and effort. Thank you, Councillor Rothwell. Councillor Rothwell, you're exactly right. Thank you very much. A lot of effort does go into the, the work of um, supporting accessibility in our communities. And um, as mayor, I thank you too. Thank you. There, there are two areas that I would like to point out where we do need to do some work. Um, North Booth Perth is doing extremely well in the built environment area. But in two areas across the county, we do need to make some improvements when it comes to employing people with disabilities. We do have um, a labor shortage. We're, we're bringing people in from outside of the county 
to meet the needs of industry in this area, and yet we do have a pool of people with disabilities who are underemployed um, across the country, uh, including this area. So I, I am looking at um, st some statistics, and the, and the Accessibility Advisory Committee is looking at putting something together to, to hopefully address that. The second area is, uh, it pertains to the, the need for on-demand accessible taxi cabs. Uh, I believe there is one accessible taxi cab in North Perth. Um, across the county, including the city of Stratford, we're really struggling with meeting that need. What this means is that uh, when uh, somebody with a disability is looking for a ride, they have to plan in advance because the only thing that's available to them in North Perth besides one accessible taxi is uh, a service where you are required to make bookings in advance. So that's not an on-demand service, and uh, that doesn't meet the needs of most people with disabilities who would like to run an errand or go visit friends or family. So we do need to try to make some improvements. The problem is we, the legislation needs to change, and so that when they review the transportation standard, I am hoping that they tighten that up a little bit and perhaps provide some incentives for taxi companies to, uh, to provide that service. Councillor Siley. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Um, Julia, do you know if there's any grant money coming available? I'm, I guess I'm speaking for our Legion Home in Listow here. They, they uh, have a problem with their accessibility going down into their Legion Home and then going upstairs. And you know, they've had a couple close calls there, and they, they know that they have, they have something they have to address. Um, do you have any direction for them? I don't know of any grants available at this time. There are sometimes infrastructure grants that do become available and they vary as to who they're available to. So you just have to, you know, kind of keep your eyes and ears open. I can certainly let um, the clerk know if I do hear of any um, grants for the built environment. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, this 225, that's, that's not mandatory now with the... The, the Ontario government set out a goal for an accessible Ontario by 2025, uh, and there's still certainly a lot of work to do. Um, the built environment, uh, the requirements are that if we are building new, we must meet the requirements in the Ontario Building Code and the Design of Public Spaces Standard. And if we're making significant renovations to existing public spaces, then we are to meet those requirements as well. So we're not required to retrofit, so it'll be some time before municipalities, businesses, and so on will be making those changes. So it won't be 2025, as far as the built environment goes, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you. If you do see something that's available for funding or whatever, I'd appreciate you getting it back to me, Pat. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, any other comments or questions? Okay, I have a resolution for our consideration that reads as follows, that North Perth Council receives the Joint Accessibility Plan Annual Status Update 2019 Report, and further that North Perth Council approves the Joint Accessibility Plan Annual Status Update 2019, and further that staff be directed to post the Joint Accessibility Plan Annual Status Update 2019 on the North Perth website. Can I invite a mover for that? Councillor Behrens, thank you, and Councillor Rothwell. Any discussion or debate on this? Seeing none, let's have that vote. Thank you, that's carried. Julia, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, next, we have a delegation. I'd like to invite uh, Linda Stevens to the podium. Ms. Stevens has indicated she would like to address the application for a draft plan of subdivision in Atwood, number NP1803 which is expected to come to council at our next meeting. Ms. Stevens, welcome. Thank you. I have some concerns about the proposed subdivision. Um, I had problems to start with getting some information and it was passed almost immediately. Um, I was then told it would take quite a long time and it seems within about three months it's almost done. Um, 
even though I believe it's not an ideal place unless your or other municipalities would have better facilities to support multiple homes, I realize the landowners around Listowel may not. So I've tried to figure out how it could possibly work. I don't feel that we having two properties directly across from the proposed development should suffer and lose out economically and put the tenants of our land and us at risk of losing our lives or substantial injury for the development. Um, one of the roads comes straight out at an outdoor riding arena where horses are and like horses if you're riding a long traffic you're fine but if you have cars coming straight at you and within about 17 meters all of a sudden turning the horses can rear and stuff like that as I'm sure you already know but anyways um, so I think burying of the ditch through our land for this development um, might be an option instead of more water coming onto our land when often the, the ditch is dry. Um, I think moving the one road along the side of the railway so it could join with the walking trail would be um, good use of the walking trail and biking trail because I think that's what they're promoting it as. Um, that might also encourage part of the traffic to go along the race course road instead of coming to Main Street and Highway 23. Um, there's also concern with, we have normal fe farm fence of course, and blowing up garbage can hurt or, or kill animals like a horse I recently heard of just taking a bite out of a Tim Hortons cup and of course it went down and the horse almost died. Um, also with the sound and the noise and the lights, they're actually proposing to dead end a street right at our front door. And when we built our house, we were told we couldn't build farther back because it wouldn't be a good use of the land. Um, and I think limiting their population, um, I seen in, in there that they were gonna try to reduce the size of the lodge so they could get more population. So I think maybe limiting the population would would assist in easing all the road traffic, all the people needing busing to schools where we don't have any schools in Outwood, and the traffic to get in and out to use like hockey, doctors, because we have none of that, and we don't have much shopping there either. So I don't think cramming more people in is a, a wise decision either. The culverts on both sides of Monument Road are very deep. It's not even wide enough to have a little dotted line down the middle of the road. And if they're advertising people walking, that puts the people walking in a lot of danger. We have people already falling off the road in their cars against their farm fences, which is hazardous to the people as well as the very animals. Um, some of those ditches are like five feet of water in spring and fall, and then they dry right up. Our culverts on our land, there's a little ditch that goes through, um, are meant for it drying up most of the, the year. And it's not meant to be always soft there. Like we can walk through in running shoes um, quite often. And now it sounds like they're gonna put more water onto our land. We have filled in our low spots over the years so that we don't have as much flooding and now they're um, talking and putting more water, which would lead to flooding. Um, we don't feel it should be our loss of land if they have to widen the the creek. Um, also in the latest bulletin that went around, it looks like they've now taken half of my house and put it into um, park land and taken more of our land where the creek was to to make it into park land, which it wasn't before according to the coloring on the diagram. Um, the farm fences we have are normal farm fences. There's the odd time we get debris, like I mentioned from the rest of town. Well, if you put houses a lot closer, that's gonna put more debris because of the um, garbage and recycling and again, jeopardize the animals, which I don't think is fair. So whether 
they put a solid fence to, to stop that. There was mention they could possibly put trees on our land, but that would be giving up our land, and then we'd have to maintain the trees, we'd have to cut down the trees, um, and it not going to stop everything. Um, I'm trying not to talk too long. <laughs> I've got many, many complaints. Um, worried about the sand and salt because now they're going to have to do more and and put it like getting into our farm fields and plugging up the the drains and the ditches. I'm worried about the traffic going on to Monument Road. There's been times where we have to sit there for five minutes if there's a big combine which comes down the, the street. And how are the houses on the corner going to get out when there's going to be thousands of traffic? Because I don't agree with their traffic study. If, if you're going to put that many houses in a place where there's no shopping, there's no recreation other than a park land, um, all the doctors you have to go into less school or farther for um, to afford to live in a new house you need at least two incomes normally to work out at side and then if you have to travel everywhere I, I think there's going to be thousands of people and and er, sorry at least a thousand trips of of a vehicle out of the the area and most of them look to be coming down monument um, I, I feel sorry for the health and how are the people going to back out of their driveways right on the corner there. Our land, by the way, goes right from the railway track to Highway 23. Um, but there is a house in the corner that's not ours. Um, the land value, I think our land value will diminish because it's no longer a nice hobby farm. Our barn with animals is, I think, 50 meters. I, Sorry, I'm kind of nervous here. I'm not, I probably have my numbers wrong. Um, it's just right across the road. Um, I'm worried about houses looking right in at us. Um, I tried to build a hedge and it was doing good. Then they dug part of it out um, for the sewers. But um, it's eight feet high and now they rose Monument Road so they can still see right in. Um, so lack of privacy there. The local wells, since 87, they've gone at least down 20 feet in our other house. So if you put that many houses right across there draining the water table, I don't think that's ideal for Atwood um, or us. And I don't Im imagine they'll be around to, to pay for everybody's wells in a few years. Um, I'm concerned about our dump. I heard it already had a short lifetime, and now I see in the newspaper where recycling isn't taking as much recycling, so that's going to impact our dump. Um, I'm concerned with the underground water reserve, all the bacteria, like when they have to drain it out of there every now and then. Um, where is it going to go? Probably across our land and our animals be drinking it. Um, Atwood has no hydrants, so I don't think they should be cramming houses closer to gather. Um, and probably those people come and then they'll want hydrants and that's another expense when people are still trying to pay off the sewer costs in Atwood. Um, the tear down of the major trees is a concern of mine. Um, the policing is a concern when you put that many people and no employment, not enough employment in the area to um, satisfy them. There's no schools and stuff, if they get hurt or their vehicle breaks down, they'll have to go on social assistance or come and steal our stuff. Not that we have much, but um, it's a concern. Um, the safety of children, because they have to come all the way to Listowel, and I heard Listowel was already looking at portable, so they didn't don't have sufficient capacity there, from what I heard. Um, I didn't see any bus stop for the kids there either, so that's a concern in the wintertime. Um, the buses and taxis, like even if someone's vehicles break down, I, uh, we don't have buses or taxis in, in Atwood, and they're talking about one coming from Stafford, but I'm sure it's not going to run through Atwood to Lestool every hour or two. Um, my understanding was it was going to be very periodic. Um, I 
I don't think the neighbors should have to give up their land to widen Monument Road to have the bike trails, the walking trails, or even make it so two vehicles can easily pass. Um, I'm concerned with our laneway being so close to the other one that people will come tearing into our laneway. We already have lots of people turning around in our laneway and um, getting confused where they were going, I guess. Um, the debris from the walking trail already along the back of our land, we get de debris from it, so you put hundreds of more people. I'm sure they're not going to be any cleaner than the ones we already have, so it'll add to, to that cleanup and work. Um, oh, our barn's within 50 meters, I guess, of the property is what I measured according to Google. Um, and our outdoor livestock riding arena is within 17 meters. Um, <laughs> am I out of time? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, um, danger to people coming and petting and, and um, bugging our animals um i i have fear for our fire department they're volunteer and um if there's that many more people they'll have that many more calls and nobody should have to see all that stuff that that much um i think it's a big rapid development that's a little bit too much too fast for a, a place that has no um, local policing no local employment and I can tell you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Thank managing you. time, that's all. Yeah. Um, Councillors, I'd entertain one or two questions at most, if you have them, for Ms. Stevens. Uh, Councillor Johnston. Um, Thank you, Linda. You talked about the culvert that's on your land. Is it, is it on your land or is it on municipal land on, on Monument Road? And is it a private drain or is it part of a municipal drain. Okay, so Monument Road basically comes here and this would be our land. We have two culverts to cross over the municipal drain so that we can get to the other part of the, the farm field. So those are your culverts? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from councillors? One other quick sure. one. Go ahead. Are you on your own well or are you on municipal water? In our, our own wells. Okay. Any other councillor wanted one question? Okay. Thank Sorry. you, Ms. Stevens. I, I know that the public uh, information meeting on this subject is next uh, council meeting. It is a public meeting. Considered a zoning bylaw amendment will be considered by North Perth Council next Monday night, March the 9th, commencing at 7 p.m. The actual notice you'll find on the municipal website, as well as I believe I did share it with North Perth Councillors in preparation for tonight. Great. Another opportunity next week. Thank you. Um, that moves us to agenda item number five. <clears throat> so tonight, um, with the change that we made in our agenda earlier in the meeting, um, we do not have uh, a report from the CAO's department, uh, which moves us to item 5.2. And uh, for item 5.2, I'll invite uh, the clerk, Pat Bearfelds, to speak to a proposal from the Listowel Kinsman Club for a new parade route for the annual Patty Fest Parade. Uh, Ms. Bearfelds, welcome. Council, this um, report tonight is actually for information. Um, since the adoption of the um, North Perth Special Events Policy and the procedure that North Perth Council did approve, the whole process has changed in regards to moving forward with community events and community parades. So tonight, the, this is for information for you. The Patty Fest, um, members of the Patty Fest executive as well as our OPP sergeant, Quello. We have met a couple of times in regards to laying out the process for this year's annual parade um, and everyone seems satisfied with the changes. The applicable paperwork has been filled out for myself to, to proceed with the permit and tonight what I wanted to do as well is bring that to your attention not requiring the um, normal council resolution that we've done in the past but basically showing you how as um, per the advice of OPP the route has changed in regards to moving forward with parades in North Perth. 
It has been initiated and because of the unsafe conditions that staging parades was causing on Nelson Avenue. Anyone that's participated in the parade will understand what I'm saying. So the OPP is feeling that having now moved over to have our camp, using the one portion of the roundabout, proceeding only on Main Street, the small portion on Wallace, is going to provide a better opportunity for a direct route, um, as well as opening up then the south side of the town of Listowel, Alma Street especially, that's going to provide an opportunity for people to move around the parade roof that may not want to stay and join us. It's just making it easier and safer for the community. So um, everyone is on board, as well as our last parade of exp experience, um, the parade sort of separated, if I can, and uh, the request has been that we ask that three individuals assist in each parade, one at the beginning, one in the middle, one at the end, just to keep the parade working along, working with the OPP. So that's, again, just for information, um, and we're hoping that this runs smoothly for this year's annual parade. Councillors, any questions for Ms. Bearfelds on this report? Councillor Andreessen. Thank you for you, uh, Mayor Todd Kaysenberg. I just wondered, I have a question, Pat. Is this just for the Pi Fest parade or for all parades moving forward? This is for all parades moving forward. So okay. our next opportunity will be working with the annual parade for the Agriculture Society. Thank you. Further questions, Councillor Seiler? Thank you, Mayor Todd. Uh, so this will be closure of Haver Camp? Yeah, they're going to stage on the side of Hanver Camp. The police will be at the roundabout as well as on Benny Street with those efforts. So there'll be no access to the, the business owner there? And they apparently have been informed of that They're by informed. the kinsmen. Okay. That's responsibility of the parade <laughs> organizers, been, but they should have been organized or told by that. So have you had confirmation of that? I haven't. I've been, that's been left with the kinsmen. Okay, thanks, because that's, uh, on weekends, it's a busy day around Johnson's Yard there. They're loading a lot of trailers that are moving up east. We have trucks going there. So we'll remind the kinsmen to have that conversation. I think that would be a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, further questions, councillors? Okay, seeing none, I have um, a resolution for our consideration that reads as follows that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth received the information, sorry, received for information, the report entitled Annual Patty Fest Parade Route, dated March 2nd, 2020. Can I invite a mover for this? Councillor Anstead, and seconded by Councillor Duncan, thank you. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried. Thank you. Uh, next up uh, is item 5.2.2. Council is asked to further consider a matter placed before it by delegation last week pertaining to the installation and administration of a new digital sign in downtown Listowel. Per Council's request, Chief Building Official Ed Podnowitz has brought forward a report and recommendation. Welcome, Mr. Podnowitz. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kaysenberg, uh, members of Council, uh, staff, and public. Uh, so, in my report, I uh, identified that we did have a delegation last council meeting. There was uh, a lot of information brought forward by the proponent for an LED display, display sign, and that would be located on the, uh, on the face of the building on the corner of Wallace and Inkerman, and it would be uh, abutting Inkerman Street. Um, the proponent uh, appeared to have satisfied council in regards to some of the concerns they had in the the lighting and the rotation of the sign and that type of thing. And council directed uh, staff to come back with a report. Um, so I, in review of the sign bylaw, um, there are three areas in the general requirements and I've listed them here as 2.1 or 11, 2.26 and 2.27. And they all seem to focus on um, safety on that intersection. Um, so, and it refers to the inspector's opinion, and I've been uh, working for the municipality for about 20 years, and I have, um, in my time here, experienced some 
uh, some concerns on that intersection. There has been some, uh, actually one pedestrian fatality. There has been some collisions there. Uh, so I just thought I'd better bring that to Council's, uh, uh, bring it to Council's uh, for information. And so I based my recommendation on on those three areas of the sign bylaw. And it is a very, very busy intersection for motors and, and pedestrians and has and does have a history of collisions and pedestrian injuries. Um, I have looked at other sign bylaws um, from Sault Ste. Marie, Guelph, uh, London, and they all seem to have a common theme. They do actually specify a, um, a distance to traffic lights and to pedestrian crossings. They, they're not all consistent. There's some that are 50 meters, some are 100 meters, uh, but they all seem to refer to that in, the, in some of the other bylaws I, I did research. So based on my findings here and, and taking into consideration these sections of the general requirements, I've uh, made my recommendation to council. So uh, entertain any questions if you have any. Councillors, questions or requests for insight here? Councillor Rothwell. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks very much for your report, Ed. I appreciate uh, your uh, efforts on that. I do share the same uh, issues of concern in terms of the uh, safety requirements, and I think it is appropriate that we uh, have an additional uh, review from an engineer uh, to look at both uh, pedestrian and traffic uh, safety there. Uh, and again, our public health and safety is a, is a crucial issue for us. I think it would, uh, you know, we need to balance that in terms of uh, looking at the possibility of, of this sign and so on. But I mean, I think it's uh, appropriate that we look at uh, agreeing or uh, 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 moving forward with the recommendation of, uh, of uh, our staff mm -hmm. here in terms of uh, requiring engineering uh, review of that uh, intersection and the possible. Uh, implications if we do allow for the digital sign. Okay. Further questions or comments at this point? Councillor Richardson. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric Eisenberg. And through you, just uh, wondering, it was mentioned um, by the Mr. Wilson last week that he was, I do believe, uh, Corey Wilson? Yeah. That whether it was it the sign company that had provided the information before to say that there had been no interference with uh, intersections? Was that the sign company, or was that something that the sign company had um, commissioned company? through an engineer? Because he said there had been no reports of any conflicts with uh, intersections or with uh, affecting pedestrian flow or anything like that. Was that just a statement from the sign company themselves, or was that uh, somehow gleaned from an engineer's report of some description? I did include uh, uh, Mr. Wilson's. Uh, is okay. Yeah, I think there was something uh, in regards to that in, uh, in the presentation that was that was made. Now I don't know whether the sign company actually has an engineer that would, you know, re review that intersection and make some proposals or a report or something to satisfy our, our requirements. Um, and I know Mr. Wilson is in the audience today, but uh, I know this isn't a public meeting, so I, if you wanted to uh, have Mr. Willis, uh, Wilson address that question. I think because Mr. Wilson's here, if he'd like to address that, I think Council would be interested in, in hearing about that. Yeah, to that tune, um, the information that I provided last week was uh, presented to me from led to go the, the provider of the sign. Uh, in their experience over the 14 years and I believe 26 countries that they do business with, it was not an issue that they had found had come to resolution and was proven that the sign had actually been the cause of any accident. That's what I've been provided. Thanks. Uh, further questions or comments uh, of staff or of Mr. Wilson at this point? Councillor Seiler. Thank you, Mayor Todd. I, I'm kind of hoping this all works out well. Uh, uh, I think that'll make that a, a nice corner after it's all addressed and the sign up. I can kind of see it looking nice to give us a bright side of it.
Thanks, Councillor Simon. Uh, questions or comments, uh, Councillor Barrett? Just a few comments, and through uh, you, Mayor, to our CBO. I'm a little bit confused by some of the things that you're citing, um, because it says a sign illuminated with red or amber lighting to diminish or detract in any way from the effectiveness of any traffic signal. There is no traffic signal at that intersection. And it doesn't fall within the vision of the motorist. So, like, I don't think that 2.11 really applies here. As well, I don't necessarily think that 2.26 applies because it's not being um, constructed in any way to obstruct the view of pedestrians or traffic. Like, it, it's far enough back on the building that I don't necessarily believe that this is a huge issue. Neither the pedestrian crosswalk or the intersection is signalized. So, like, I mean, people aren't paying attention going through that intersection at the best case scenario, and we all see it all the time, right? Um, do we really believe that this one more sign halfway back the building wall is going to change that, I guess is what the question is. But, like, it really isn't impeding the view of the pedestrians or motorists. It's like it's not constructed so that it's impeding any signalization because there is none. So I'm a little bit confused by the items that have been cited as the reason why we need an engineer. I'm not saying it wouldn't be nice to have a brief engineer's report on it, but I'm not necessarily sure that it doesn't that it falls within these particular three um, items that were quoted in the sign by bylaw. Like, sorry, I'm just confused, Ed. Well, that's that's perfectly fine, Councillor Burns. Uh, and I put them sections in there specifically because it does refer to interfere rather than obstruct. So there are signs there. there there's yellow crosswalk signs. I mean, if somebody's looking at this display sign moving and they just don't happen to see these yellow signs. And it's the other thing I noticed today, and I, I can point it out to uh, Mayor Kassenberg, is there is another sign that uh, is located on the Smith uh, Market Square. And that sign pretty well obliterates that, that post sign until you get past it. And by the time you get past it, you're going to be seeing this 8 by 12 sign, and you're fairly close to that intersection by that time. CEO Snell. Uh, so I suspect this is why the um, manager of operations had his hand up too as well. But that intersection is um, in the future budget for signalization for a flashing light crosswalk. So although there's no signalization there today, it is part of the, uh, the plan for um, the crosswalk study that was done. And as council may remember, there was thought of it going further to the north as part of the work done by Triton to date. Okay, thank you, CEO Snow. Now, Councillor Behrens, it looks like you have, you're sitting on the edge of your chair. No, I'm not. Okay, uh, Councillor Richardson. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Mark Hasenberg. I'm just, on one hand, I can understand why you brought the points forward, and I do appreciate them. I'm just wondering, and I could certainly, and I would agree in part, um, if this was like going to be a full, animated board. I could see that being a significant because sometimes you can't take your eyes off watching even if you don't want to watch it. 
you go into the Tim Hortons and you can't help but watch the, t the moving TV screen. But I would think, I don't know how much of a vis visual deterrent it would really be, even if there was the pedestrian light there. I'm not an engineer and I'm not professing to be one or a building inspector. I'm just stating my opinion. If there was a slow fade and a longer pause in between the pictures because people would see it, see a picture, I'm thinking at a 10 to a 30 second flip, whatever, to go to the next image. If it was going to be proposed as being animated and showing clips or something like moving banners and to do stuff like that, I would agree with that. However, if it was constructed in such a way that there were, I shouldn't say static images, but as this images came up and stayed for a longer period of time and not necessarily flip, 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 where people can look at it, they see it, and then in 10, 15 seconds it changes, or whatever the time interval, like slower, gradual, fade, fade to screen, I would agree if, if the, that was going to be brought out. Uh, animated, no, I would think that that would certainly, you got something flashing, you're going to take a look to your right-hand side if you happen to be traveling southbound. Um, <clears throat> I guess I don't know, is there any merit, like from from our traffic study, like to even get a comment from an engineer on it. Like, I don't know if you'd really want to, I certainly applaud Mr. Wilson for bringing this forward. And I would like to see it go forward. And we don't want to mire it down with engineer studies and everything, but it would be nice to have even a co provide a comment um, from an engineer like saying what they would think, like a traffic engineer. Like if they raised a flag of suspicion, then okay, maybe take it in point. But I don't think you want, we really want to, encumber with an entire full re engineering report because then that takes that makes it just prohibitive I, in my opinion but is there any way that we could possibly get an opinion for for just for what their two cents so i'll recognize uh, mr couch our manager of operations so the chief building official and i corresponded on this today um we do have access to triton who is the engineering firm that already did the study uh, that intersection pedestrian crossings and traffic crossings uh, was very near meeting uh, traffic signal warrants. Um, we're going to review that again this year, and we're going to take a look at whether we would uh, move to traffic signals as a recommendation. That again needs MTO approvals, uh, as well as looking at the pedestrian crossover as the other option on the north side. Given that we don't know where the location of the lights are going to be or what types of lights we're going to use, we wanted to make sure, not so much about obstruction, but distraction, that this would be distracting from a safe intersection and the functioning of pedestrian crossings in the area. Um, if we talk to an engineer, they'll be able to talk to us a little bit about more urban environments that have more lighting and more illumination and more signs in them. And uh, we're hoping for a quick comment back on that, given the proximity and the angle of the sign. Uh, so that's what we're looking for, and we're hoping to get that uh, shortly. I just had this conversation today. Hopefully we can do that as part of the next uh, few weeks' work on the traffic core uh, project that we're doing. Uh, Councillor Richardson, go ahead. Uh, and thank you, thank you, Supplemental. Thank you, Lyndon, for that. With that uh, comments from Triton being either for or against, with that, uh, how would you feel with that, Ed? Or CBO, pardon me. Well, I think I think it's Council's uh, decision if if they're satisfied with the. Yeah, I just want like you're the building inspector, but I would think that if you received comments that were in the positive for that, that would be. Yeah. Agreeable. Yeah. No, I agree, and I think uh, when uh, Mr. Wilson did his presentation, he did address a lot of concerns. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was extending the the rotation of the sign, and he did mention that there was no, not going to be any animation included on the sign. Um, so I think he did address a lot of concerns that Council had at last meeting. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Councillor Richardson. <laughs> Anyone else want to have questions about this? Okay, so I, I have a uh, draft resolution that speaks to the CBO's recommendation. Does council, council want to entertain that at this point? Okay. So um, the proposed for our consideration that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth requests the applicant provide a report by a qualified traffic engineer with regards to the impacts on public safety, both pedestrian and motorists. Can I invite a member for that? Uh, Councillor Richardson, seconded by... Councillor Duncan, okay, so that's on the floor. Discussion or debate? Uh, Councillor Rothwell. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'm just wondering in, in terms of uh, what our uh, manager of public works has said and, and so on, if in fact we're going to re require the applicant to do this or if in fact we as a municipality are going to do this. Uh, 
it would seem appropriate to me that uh, we go on the basis of what uh, Manager of Operations Coach has said in terms of uh, Ms. Pally undertaking further conversation with uh, Trident to have uh, the work undertaken. So that's the reason perhaps that the mover and seconder would look at a modification to uh, or withdraw the motion we, we uh, suggest in terms of what uh, Manager of Operations Coach has said in terms of uh, Ms. Pally having discussions and, and getting a uh, response from uh, our traffic engineer uh, Trident on this. Okay. Uh, let's turn back to the uh, the mover and seconder just to see whether what their general reaction is to Councillor Rockwell's suggestion. Uh, Councillor Richardson. Uh, I'd be willing to do that with the wording of the recommendation uh, that the municipality of North Perth requests comment by a qualified traffic engineer. If we just change it to comment, then we'd get it back from Triton. Would that suffice? Comment from a qualified traffic engineer, and then the rest verbatim, as recommended. No, that's okay with you? Okay. Okay, so it looks like we have um, consent from the mover and seconder for modifying this resolution. Um, further council discussion or debate? Okay, let me read the resolution into the record one more time. Uh, that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth requests comment by a qualified traffic engineer with regards to the impacts on public safety, both pedestrian and motorists. Deputy Mayor Callahan. And this is through the municipality, uh, not yes. through Mr. Wilson. We're going to qualify this council. Is that what we want to do? Paid for by the municipality or sought by the municipality? Okay, sought by the municipality. Let's put that. Councillors, everyone know what we're voting on, just to make sure that we're all aligned here. Okay, uh, let's have that vote then. And that's carried. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now we turn to a matter submitted for our consideration by our interim manager of uh, recreation. Uh, for item 5.3.1, Council is asked to consider the appointment of a new ad hoc advisory committee supporting efforts for the restoration of the Atwood Cenotaph. I welcome Ms. Gangle. Thank you very much, Mayor and members of Council. Uh, the beginning of the report provides you with just some background information about uh, our uh, citizen and uh, staff involvement with the evolution of the Atwood Cenotaph. Uh, we've had discussions at the uh, budget meetings with regards to this and having good discussion with regards to some changes that we're considering. Since then, we've uh, staff have been made aware that there's several community concerns being expressed regarding these proposed changes. Uh, we're very um, appreciative to have our community involvement that we have right now, individuals in the community that are very engaged uh, but also being respectful, uh, they're also very respectful. Uh, these are big decisions for them, and they really care about their community, and they care about the cenotaph, and they want to make sure it's done right. Um, not ha f feeling that um, we maybe need to have some additional council support in order to you know, make these decisions. So because of the uniqueness of the Atwood cenotaph, and due to the variety of options that are being considered, uh, the expects need for further public input, and ensuring proper process for this project. It's recommended that the Atwood Cenotaph Restoration Group become a committee of council. Staff would invite the current members to be part of this group as well as will advertise for additional volunteers to sit on this committee. Uh, it's also recommended one to three council representatives sit on this committee. Once appointed, the Atwood Cenotaph Restoration Advisory Group will work under the following mandate. Uh, tour the Atwood Cenotaph with the staff, host a public open house to seek further input, discuss potential concepts and finalize landscape plans, finalize a budget for the recommendation of the Atwood Cenotaph Restoration Project, identify other funding options that could be available for us, uh, develop a construction plan and timelines, and then present that back to council for review and approval. Any questions? Councillor, a few questions for uh, Ms. Gangle. Uh, Councillor Seiler. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Thank you, Amy, for your report. I agree with you wholeheartedly. This is a very important piece of property 
to Atwood. It's an important corner, and I'm I'm very really happy the way you're going about this. So we can get their intake on on this and bring us back a, a good report and do it the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Siler. Uh, Councillor Anstead. Thanks, Mark Eisenberg. Through you. Thanks, Amy, for the report. Um, just talking about the committee itself. Just correct me. Um, how many people are on it currently? Uh, there are currently four official, four and a half, uh, and uh, two staff. Okay. And then just supplementary, you had said one to three council representatives, but you said invite current members and then additional volunteers. So how many total would we be looking at? Uh, I think we want to look at what the interest is, who we can have involved. I don't think that they, this particular project would cause too many restrictions having too many. Um, I mean, if we had 10, I think we'd be, we'd be happy with that, but we would take essentially if there were five or six, that would be fine as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor Rothwell. Thanks very much through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Amy, uh, again, thanks for the report. The, uh, I take it this is, this is a relatively short term life of, of this committee if council agrees, right? Because the expectation is that uh, we can come forward with a recommendation and implementation in, in this year, 2020, is that right? Or are we looking longer term? Uh, this year is our, is our plan for, I'd say, for project completion would be the ultimate component of this, this committee. Right, and again, uh, further to uh, uh, Councillor Anstead, so that uh, uh, volunteer group that was established just this past year, right? So they had put uh, the volunteer group. Uh, is it 2019? Uh, they've, they've been involved in the project. They they've assisted with our um, just overall helping with the cenotaph and those components. Just volunteers within the community helping out staff and helping to try to get uh, public engagement. Right, but they were they came together sort of as a group in 2019. Is that right, or was it before that? I think Maybe it was before bit. that. Okay, thank you. Okay. For the questions on this matter, uh, CAO Snell. Just for the clarification, and I'm apologize for not catching this in advance. Is that part of our committee? Resolution should consider whether the position is paid, and I would suggest due to the length of term, this would be an unpaid committee. So I just would like that added to the end that council members be invited to be part of the committee unpaid. Further questions, comments at this point before we consider the resolution? Okay, seeing none, I have a resolution for our consideration that reads as follows, that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth appoints the Atwood Cenotaph Restoration Advisory Group as a committee of council, and that the current members of the group be invited to be part of this committee, and that staff advertise for additional volunteers to sit on this committee, and that council members serve on this committee unpaid. Okay, uh, Councillor Duncan has a question. Go ahead. Um, uh, uh, we, don't, we don't say anything in here about how, who, how or who we're appointing as council members. True. Do we have a, a proposition for this effect? Uh, Clerk, did you want to weigh in on this one? Mm -hmm. I've brought anybody uh, a name before me at this time. We will have to put an advertisement, obviously, in the newspaper for additional members to sit on the committee. and. Usually, council comes together with their names um, themselves. Okay, so we'll. I will volunteer to sit on the committee. Uh, okay, let's get the uh, resolution here. Do we have a mover for this? Did we get that? Uh, so, Councillor Duncan has moved it and seconded by Councillor Richardson. All right, and we know that Councillor Duncan's a willing volunteer. That's good news. Um, any further deba debate or discussion on this matter? Okay, so we have a second volunteer in Councillor Rothwell. All right, uh, we're maybe getting ahead of the process a little bit, but uh, um, okay, seeing no further discussion or debate, let's have uh, the vote on this. So, is there something amiss with the technology?
Oh, there we go. And that's Kerry. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. And I'll ask the uh, clerk to note that uh, Councillors Duncan and Rothwell have volunteered. And I saw Deputy Mayor Kellum, Pat, and Dave uh, too. So we'll see what happens there. <laughs> I saw that. All right. Um, item 5.3.2 brings forward work by staff on behalf of council uh, to lay the groundwork for the creation of a dog park on municipal lands. I'll invite Ms. Gangle to bring us up to date on this file. Amy. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would like to premise this report by saying the purpose of this report is to provide some background and baseline information for council to provide direction with regards to a dog park. There's still some further details and guidelines to finalize before the plan is complete. Uh, we didn't want to get too deep into it without a direction of council. Uh, the drawing attached is meant only to provide as a general idea of location, understanding the size, uh, shape, uh, exact locations are yet to be determined. So just to, to highlight that bit. Uh, on October 28th, we received a delegation uh, requesting council to uh, have consideration for um, an acre of land towards the uh, f uh, possibility of a future dog part. In, uh, on November, staff received uh, direction from council to prepare that report, and this is what you see in front of you. We've provided uh, some details specifically to the available lands. The specific uh, available lands, that the area that we're looking at is north. I say it's north of Steve Kerr. My apologies uh, for clarification. It's north of the Spinwright soccer field. So just to let you know the, the uh, location of it. Uh, the area that we're proposing is larger. We do propose something larger than one acre in order to accommodate a small dog area and a large dog area, uh, also to minimize crowding opportunities, uh, which could increase the stress and tension in dogs. Um, in research, we've discovered the play area should allow 75 to 100 feet square feet per dog that's in that existence. Having some good running space helps with their behaviors. So that's why we're recommending that. Uh, reviewing the 2017 Parks and Recreation Master Plan, they highlight some notes with regards to the dog park recommendations. They see the benefits of that and the highlights of that. We did draft some terms of reference for consideration. Again, these will be tweaked if we go forward with the dog park. Same with the dog park rules. Uh, considerations of we highlighted some suggestions for usage of hours. We understand a complaint process will have to occur. We are, um, we've reached out to the accessibility uh, committee for their guidance as well. So we still have some details to look at. We did highlight some advantage and disadvantages. Uh, advantages meets requests from our public for this, this request. Uh, it's supported by Recreation Master Plan. It encourages physical exercise, socialization, and a greater sense of community. It encourages networking, educational, and recreational opportunities. It encourages a place for dogs to run instead of in our sports fields. Uh, greatly reduces dog owners having their dogs off-leash at other areas. Provides a safe place for exercise off leash dogs so it does not infringe on the rights of other community residents using other sections of our parks and trails, such as cyclists, joggers, small children, and those who maybe feel from dogs. And an exercise dog makes for a better behaved dog. There are some disadvantages we've highlighted. Uh, additional resources and costs will be needed in order to maintain uh, this as well as build it. Uh, there is risk management. Taking note, any infrastructure, especially recreation infrastructure, uh, risk management is part of that. There is risk in play. Uh, there is risk of uh, disease, transmission, fleas, ticks, illness, etc. Uh, some animals can have poor socialization uh, and increase uh, public complaints specific to that zone. The secret that we've, in the research that we've had for a successful dog park is creating a healthy dog park culture. Part of that is choosing the right location that is uh, being respectful of the neighborhood around it, uh, the individuals using it, that element to it. 
it has uh, to do with um, the culture that we create within that park. So making sure that uh, dog owners are aware that they are in control of their animals at all times, whether they're on leash or off, making sure that they understand that uh, typically they should be, uh, owners should be moving all the time. They shouldn't be sedentary because animals will recognize that uh, if they're not moving, then they'll start to take on some behaviors. Uh, and those are just examples of some of the pieces they have. I've highlighted uh, some details of some neighboring dog parks. Uh, these are, this is the information that we've received from ones that have responded to me. So there's several others out there. These are just, this is just some information that we have here. Uh, I do have an update from Mitchell. They do not have a group involved, and it's Parks Recreation and their bylaw officer that enforces their rules. Um, construction, so financial component. The construction costs uh, $100,000. This is what the delegation proposed. They're estimating that. That's what their goal is for fundraising to be able to offset that. If the costs of the park itself, uh, you know, it may not itself cost $100,000, but perhaps it's amenities around it if we need additional parking, uh, lighting, water sources. If we need any of those, those costs would be inclu included in that. We've given an, an estimated annual operation costs. Uh, if the capital costs were down, then the depreciation costs would, would also come down. These are our best guests. Uh, we've highlighted some ideas for cost recovery, and uh, we've made a suggestion of recommendation, but we're open to council's direction at this stage. Councillors, questions for Ms. Gangle on her extensive uh, research and report. Councillor Bass. I'm just concerned with the proposed location because we don't know what all is going to go at that site and there was a reason why we chose that site. I don't believe that putting dogs near a soccer park, near a recreation complex, or near a public elementary school is in the best interest of anyone. Okay. So I, I don't agree with the location. If there are other locations to look at, certainly can look at that, but not this one because we don't know what the future use of all that property is going to be. Did you want to make comment about uh, whether you've looked at other locations at this point? Um, or? This particular one, so uh, back in 2013-14, we did extensive uh, assessments of locations. We brought forward three options for council, and none of those were good, viable options. Uh, this particular area was the request of the delegation, so that's where we looked at that as well. Looking at that, um, you're looking at some of the terrain that is there, uh, not foreseeing residential development uh, involved in that area um, and laying out some guidelines with regards to making sure the dog park is, has within uh, 50 meters of sports fields, uh, avenues. Uh, we can go up to 120 meters is, is what seems to be anywhere from 50 to 100 is what I'm seeing in other municipalities. Did you consult the school at all? Yes, in my report, it, it does highlight that we've spoken with the principal. They had no concerns as long as it was fenced. Their biggest concern had to do actually with the, um, the bus route and people parking in the bus route. Having some additional parking space that would be east of the uh, soccer field, uh, we thought might be a good location that would get them closer to that and, and deter them from being in that area. Other questions at this point? Deputy Mayor Kellum? Yes, sir. You, Mayor Kaysenberg, in a, in a great uh, presentation. Um, I do support a dog park, but as Councillor Barron says, I do not like uh, the location. I don't think I can support that location. I'd be the first to say location is the trickiest thing for any municipality. It doesn't matter how big or how small you are. It is the number one challenge of finding the best location for a dog park. So we're, we're receiving that respectfully, for sure. Okay, uh, supplementary, uh, Deputy Mayor. Yes, sir, you again. Do we still own the old landfill site? 
Is that a yes. potential location? It, it no? was one of the previous options back in 2014, but the discovery of the cost that would be needed for an environmental survey were higher than what you would want to put in a dog park development. Okay. C.O. Snell, did you want to weigh in generally uh, on something that wasn't mentioned yet? I just wanted to consider location and 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 the three point two nine acres. I, th I think is probably more than what we need, and it's a bit deceiving because the other the, the aerial photo doesn't show the exact location of the soccer field and or complex. But the one thing um, that we could consider, if council is considered, we could go to the north side of the stormwater management pond, which would take it farther away. Now that does just make it that much more remote for. Um, everybody else but that is property that is municipally owned and would be large enough yeah okay okay um, councillor Seiler thank you Mayor Todd thank you Amy for your report and I am a dog person I love, I love dogs I always carry my cookies with me in the truck <laughs> I have lots of dog friends but um I guess uh, I did some research on different uh, municipalities with dog parks, like Guelph, uh, Barrie, Midland, and it's just very disturbing of some of the outcomes of what people are doing at these dog parks, and uh, the liability is, is a big issue for me, and it's a big issue for these other municipalities that are hosting these dog parks, like uh, they're putting glass, the dogs are cutting their feet, and they're putting poison down them and they'll get sick and, and it's going back to the municipality and it's just too bad those things are happening and that, so the liability bothers me one thing and the financing uh, it's a uh, was 114,000 up front to get it going that would be fundraised by by uh, wagon tail dog park well, I, that concerns me a bit like I'd like to see the money uh, raised first yeah raised first and I don't like the idea of raising the money and putting it into our, our trust. Mm -hmm. I would like it raised uh, beforehand. Uh, location is another concern of mine. And the operating costs after the dog park is in place, the 14000 a year is a concern, mm -hmm. how that's going to be handled and, and carried on. And I don't know if it's it. Like it's so anything else. Is the the rate payers' responsibility to, to keep this operating or... So those are a lot of those are some of my concerns, and uh, I'm kind of. I will try to remember them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, from the liability perspective, it is very important for council to be aware of the risk of a dog park, but it's also equivalent to uh, having a multi-purpose trail. Uh, it is also the same of using doing uh, having programs in a in a facility. Uh, so. Absolutely, there is risk. Uh, no doubt, council does need to be aware of that. Um, with regards to broken glass, things being thrown, uh, toxic poisoning, uh, could it happen here for sure? It is currently happening in our parks and our trails as we speak, so it, it's, it's just the nature of the game. Uh, unfortunately, I agree with you with that. Uh, okay, second question. Councillor Richardson. Um, thank you, Mayor, Mayor Kaysenberg. Thank you, Amy. Good report. I'm just questioning. I don't really have a problem. If the school's on board with it, I don't really have a problem um, with the location of it. There is adequate parking if they do, and I do understand that. I'm just wondering about the size, and I know that that's more size. Like you said about a recommendation, 75 to 100 square feet for play area for a dog. With the size that we have here, we have enough room for 1,300 dogs. I'm just wondering, approximately, is that a little too much, too quick, like to put up the park? Like that's a, that's a lot of play area. Yeah, I think I think w looking at the area, of the terrain itself, uh, if there was an area that had a natural water or a water source, then that takes away the land component of it. So it was just sort of the terrain piece. Certainly, if council wants to limit it to just one acre, totally fine to do that. Um, just having that area for that space for many, many dogs to be able to be around. Uh, supplemental to that. I'm not meaning to make it a bare minimum 
you know, chihuahuas only, like for the small area. But I just want to just make sure that mm -hmm. if they're recommended, is one, it, what, does one acre include small dog and large dog, like yeah, they're recommended, or are they two totally yeah, different? Yeah, it didn't get into that specific. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like maybe like an acre and a half or two acres or something, because you get 3.29 acres yeah. um, and possibly coordinated. I don't really have an issue with the location. And like you said, there's going to be issue, any location you could bring up a page of issues of why not to put it there, provided that we can can be assured or be somewhat more comforted that it's not going to be part of a development going forward and even long-term planning to look at that, that well, there's no way that this could become part of a development in the future, because I certainly don't want to hinder that with a dog park. I like the idea of a dog park, but I want to make sure that we're covering all of our bases even many years in the future. Um, and there's going to be liability with anything. Um, that's the unfortunate business of being a municipality and providing these services uh, or these opportunities for the people. But uh, I still think it's too big at 3.29. I would think two might good. I don't think we want to come out of the gate and, you know, having the a huge dog park, unless the other ones are all that size coming out. I just think that's a little uh, uh, large to start with. Certainly, we can certainly downscale it, probably overestimated just being on that safe side to work within a space that we have in that area. So thank you for that. Councilor Andreessen. Um, thank you. Thank you, through you, Mayor Tasenberg. Um, Amy, a tremendous amount of work to already put into this, so I do appreciate that. And I am also, I, you know, I support, I support the uh, dog park in terms of its idea and theory and purpose. Um, just to echo the comments around size, if we had a, a dog park in the size range of 3.29 acres, the fencing of that, and I realize it's going to be fundraised, it's just the maintenance of that too. Um, I would have concerns of that. Um, to contain those dogs, I, I would be quite worried if something would happen with the fencing. And just on top of that, um, it's just about rule enforcement. Um, and if we take a look at what some of the other municipalities are doing, um, there are different ways that they're handling it, whether it's through bylaw or, you know, you know different associations or parks and rec. Um, that's actually my greatest concern is what happens if, you know, dogs are attacking each other or there's, there's a complaint or there's a, um, some kind of disagreement among dog owners. That is really hard to mitigate, and you know, aside from having someone on yard duty looking after these dogs and their owners, um, you know, my concern is over time is that going to require someone from Parks and Rec standing there during the open hours? Um, I think it just begs the question of really thinking about about this a lot more with the committee mm -hmm. about how we're to handle and support that. The um Number one message I've received from a neighboring municipality is you is having a group community or having an association to be part of this is key. Uh, it does help with that culture. People, they, these are the individuals that are there more often. They help teach people. They educate them about how this is handled. And that prevents a lot of those those uh, situations from occurring. For sure, is 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 a big pe uh, key part. Definitely. Councillor Anstead. Thanks, Mayor Kaysenberg. Thanks again, Amy, for the report. Uh, just briefly, um, I too struggle with the location. Um, just looking at liability, um, I know you included something from the Frank Cowan Group, so thank you for that. Um, talks about the Dog Owners Liability Act, which we have that, I get that. But questions I would have, would our current insurance provider um, allow us to stay on the current policy that we're on? Would it go far enough? And if it wouldn't, what would we need to do to, to get it to the next level? From my understanding of speaking to them, this is treated the same as our trails, our parks, anything that we own. Um, their push is the risk management. You make sure, and that's where these recommendations are in. Staff are going to need to do inspections. We are going to need to do uh, maintenance. So it's, it's very important that council understands this is going to take the staff time to do that. So, so making sure uh, staff are aware of this um, and make sure we follow that. Uh, that's that's the bigger key message that we received from the insurance provider was that focus. Okay, thank you. So. Councillor Rothwell. 
Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. Through you, Amy, there's a couple quick questions I have. Uh, the first is, how, do we know how many dogs are licensed within the municipality? I don't have the number offhand. I know it's quite a few, but... How many? 2,300. All right. Good. Thank you. That's okay. significantly less than the number you were talking about in terms of uh, your other comments uh, there. Uh, certainly a lot of the dogs and so on, and, and you know, presumably a lot of people are, you know, won't necessarily take advantage of that because of their locations and so on. Uh, when we talk about location and so on, one of the issues I don't see here in terms of the costing is obviously the further, far, further back we go from the uh, soccer field and so on, is that we're probably going to have to build some sort of road and parking area. Is that, uh, was that excluded on purpose or is that going to come out of another pot of money somewhere? I, I just, you know, and, and I caution that the further back we go, the more expensive it's going to be. So this would come down to the design of the whole area be involved with, is finding the, the a location, how we can manage that. In doing a walking of this site, uh, having parking at Steve Kerr was beneficial. Individuals could have that and walk their dogs to this area. Certainly is not the most convenient. They'd like to have probably a parking spot, but closer, but it's a first step. Uh, you know, it could be further developments in order to, to have that. And then adding a, maybe a, a gravel parking lot beside the soccer field that helps with our soccer uh, users as well as overflow for Steve Kerr but could also be used for uh, dog park users and other parks. So just supplementary and again these are all things that I mean this is new to us and so on I, I understand that it's just a matter that those are going to be operational costs that are going to you know continue on which I suspect is going to increase our costs in terms of the estimated 14,000 and so on so but you know, on the other end of the spectrum, if, if we're not going for the full three uh, acre plus, uh, that's going to decrease the amount that's required for uh, costs to uh, have fencing and so on. So there's, there's a pro and a con to that piece. So I just want us to be mindful of that as we move forward. So I, I am concerned about location as well. Thank you. When I was first approached uh, by this group, uh, their initial land ask was one and a half acres just so that people understand that, that there's been a change in from the original ask that was made of me when they approached me uh, to this recommendation. So um, I don't know that they were as ambitious as three acres. And, and certainly three acres has an impact on costing of a number of the elements in uh, or naturally associated with the dog park. Uh, Councillor Barris. Yeah, like I mentioned before, Amy, I don't agree with the location. Um, and I know that we're in the process of going through asset management planning and, and trying to have efficient and effective use of all of our assets, including property. And I still would like to see you take a second look. And we're unfortunately only focusing on municipal lands, which I think is a mistake, um, because there are other properties not owned by the municipality that have access to parking are more agricultural, like the, sorry, um, the Ag Society property. Um, and it's visual for traffic coming in, not just for people who live here. Um, but we also have something, when we're doing development in that, we have parkland dedication in that. I'm not exactly sure why it's always got to be human parkland um, and not necess and not animal. You know where I'm going with that, right? Um, I'm not even concerned about the capital cost because anybody who's been on municipal council knows it's not the capital cost that's going to kill you. It's the time and the expense and the operating costs and the management. And when you say that a lot of staff time or even a fair amount of staff time is going to be devoted to supervision and making sure everyone's following the rules. That portion concerns me. So I, think, I really do think um, that we need to think outside the box a bit more and not just put it up at the Steve Kerr. Certainly. We could certainly do that. Again, uh, uh, the... Um Agricultural uh, fairgrounds was an area that was considered uh, several years ago, um, and it wasn't uh, a welcoming environment, uh, location, I should say. Mm -hmm. The ag 
Fairgrounds. Uh, okay, I guess we're on round two. Does anyone not had, who wants to weigh in on round one that they haven't had a chance to do so? Okay, um, Councillor Seiler. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Uh, Councillor Burns did bring a good point up about uh, the location, maybe like not on this property because how are we going to place on who uses this dog park? Is it only going to be for North Perth residents or is it going to be open to uh, people from outside the community? So that kind of, if you didn't have it at a place like where she was indicated, would kind of correct that. So that's another, if the, our rate payers are going to pay for this, should they have to pay for it for, from people coming in to use it? Or that's, that's a good question. So that's my comment there. So that's one other thing we should be thinking about. So just uh, reminding council. So um, a delegation came in October and in November staff recommend that we, uh, the staff come back with a location and some logistics. So we've done that. If you, I guess staff can request uh, a direction. Do you want us to continue to look at other options? Do you want us to um, go a different direction? We're open for Okay, I'll options. entertain that. Um, before we do, I want to ask one question. I just sort of want to clarify something. If off the top of your head you can remember this, or perhaps Trisha or Hale. Uh, what is the cost to taxpayers of the arenas in our community? Specifically, I don't know that. The the cost to taxpayers, so it's net after after revenue and expenses. And I think I remember when we were looking at pools that the cost at this point in time was about 110000 in operating costs per year. So when we talk about 14000 or even 40000 against the other types of recreational activities that we provide in this community, um, that's not a huge investment. Okay, uh, Councillor Richardson. Uh Thank you, um, through you, Mayor Kaysenberg. I would almost uh, recommend that we uh, defer this motion that's come forward for, like for this, because it's uh, recommending for this particular location to go back to the committee for the uh, group that's putting it forward. Look at the secondary and the third locations, even though this is their ideal, that obviously I can tell that the discontent for this location might exist at the table today, but possibly look at the alternate locations um, and maybe look at other opportunities and. I'm not saying we come back with options again, but I don't think this one is uh, seemingly quite favorable at this point in time. I like all of the other information that brought that, some really good information. And let's go with their original ask of one and a half acres. It was 1.5, Your Worship? Yeah. 1.5, but if they come back in and around there and to find out that if, there's, if this was their preferred location that is not deemed acceptable by council, maybe their secondary wouldn't be so bad like if they obviously have top three then two and three came up as well and maybe come back with and put this report into there and find out the, their thoughts on it I don't know what else to send you back to do without because I don't want it to I don't want it to go away but CEO I don't Snow. want it to yeah CEO Snow and having assisted Amy with possible locations it is really difficult even to look for an acre or an acre and a half within the existing municipally owned property. Now, I, I do think Councillor Barron's um, opportunity of private property is interesting, and maybe we just need to do some more work on that and, and possibly look at look at those options. Because when you're looking at an acre of even municipally owned land, you're already looking at a, usually existing park locations. Um, so, um, which I think bring up many of the same concerns of. Miss Potty or the councils addressing about this about this property. So we may take a look at I guess some private private land locations to see if that will will provide some insight. I think one of the things that I picked up um, from this, and and I'm intrigued by the possibility, is that it sounds like this council may be prepared to commission work, perhaps in the part of the recreation advisory committee or 
or on the part of council itself towards developing out of sort of a, a site intention plan around the Kerr lands. Uh, we may be at the point where, I mean, if we're saying we're concerned about putting a dog park in there because there might be other uses, that we need to start thinking about, well, what are the desired uses that council has for those lands? So I'm intrigued by the possibility of, of tasking the Recreation Advisory Committee in particular to um, come up or formulate a suggested plan for us with regards to the use of the future use of the Kerr lands. Um, okay, so we sit with uh, the suggestion that we uh, ask staff to uh, dig for an alternative location uh, with a smaller scale size and uh, the other issues that were raised this evening by councillors at the table um, appear to be um, on your list as well. I see you've been writing notes, uh, Ms. Kangle. So um, at this point, um, I think with council's general consent, I, I'm going to put aside the resolution that's been pro proposed to us by staff. Uh, Councillor Barons, did you want to weigh in? Um, I just, like, I don't think it's Amy's responsibility to find the area. I believe it's the delegation's responsibility to take a second look as well. I don't want to create a work project for recreation um, when this, my understanding is it's to be a cooperative effort. Um, perhaps other properties can be found. And the reason I mentioned the asset management planning is because you can't convince me that there isn't an old soccer field or an old ball diamond or an old park that wouldn't be more suitable for this type of development. Okay, that's a worthy thought. Um, I, what I don't want to have happen, I think there's general uh, consensus at council that we, we want this, we want to see some action move, moving forward on this. Um, I think it sounds like we need to go back to the Wags and Tails group and ask them uh, what they're prepared to do with regards to research around land uh, availability. At the same time, I don't think that should preclude us from asking staff to present if there are any other options or maybe even out-of-the-box options, as Councillor Behrens has suggested, with reuse of existing park lands or old fields that um, are not getting the kind of use that uh, we would like for them and would provide an appropriate facility for the dog park. So um, I think that's kind of where we sit. Do we want to have a resolution that directs staff on this at this point, uh, Councillor? but we're comfortable with that. Amy, do you feel you understand the guidance that, that council is giving you at this time? I do, thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Anything to direct to the staff with regards to this matter before we proceed with our next item on our agenda? Okay, thank you, council. That was... The... Um, as I look at the, the shape of our agenda from now to the end of the night, I, I'm not sure that it will be that much longer, but if we go a lot longer, I'll, I'll call for a break, unless you really want a break at this point. Councillor Behrens. But we never put the motion on the floor either, so. Oh, to defer. Do you want a motion to defer? Thank you. Um, okay, that brings us to item 5.4, and I see that Treasurer Hale has uh, come before us. She's to present uh, uh, for consideration the receipt of the 2019 annual repayment limit report issued for our municipality by Ontario. Good evening, Mayor Kaysenberg, members of council. The province has provided the annual repayment limit. Our schedule indicates that we can have uh, payments up to $5.4 million. Currently, we have 1.2 uh, uh, payments uh, per annum, and um, that is not including the $11.1 .1 million that we have borrowed for the wastewater treatment plant. So we will be nearing the $2 million re uh, annual payment uh, for our current debts. Um, typically, I would bring the debt report with me at the same time as this report, but it snowed. So I will bring it next Monday night <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll make it available. But uh, our payment limits are um, 
or we are currently paying 1.2 in payments and we'll be up to about two uh, by the end of this year. Okay. Councillors, any questions for Ms. Hale? Seeing none, I have a resolution for consideration that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth received the 2020 Annual Repayment Limit Report from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing for information. Can I invite a mover? Councillor Rothwell, thank you. Seconded by <coughs> Councillor Andreessen. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that uh, resolution. Okay, so Councillor Duncan registers manually, but he's in favor. That is carried. Thank you. Uh, we have no reports uh, this evening from uh, our manager of environmental uh, services. Our manager of operations uh, has uh, a report under item 5.6.1, where Council is asked to authorize a change in the rates and fees related to various public works services and to introduce damage deposits for sites that are under construction. Uh, Mr. Couch, our Manager of Operations, will address that. Thank you, Mayor Caseberg, members of Council. Yes, really just a housekeeping uh, item for many of the rates. Some of them haven't been listed in the past and they're introduced and, and listed here now. Um, that would include street sweeping and hadn't met the previous list. Um, our activities are shown and, and listed un under other fees, as uh, Mayor Caseberg had noted damage deposits have been added. This is a benefit to us and to developers um, in terms of any damages, specifically to curb line, sidewalk, and to asphalt in front of a developing property. Uh, in this way, we can do an inspection. A deposit can be given for any damages that are, occur, and then those fees would be uh, retained by the municipality to cover the costs of those. Instead of us coming in at a later date, understanding that there is damage and trying to trying to convey that there's a problem with that after the fact. So this is something we'd like to put into our processes and through the fee bylaw, we can do that with this listing. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Couch on this matter? Uh, Councillor Rothwell. For you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's related to this, but it's not direct. Uh, I've been approached by, or had to inquire from someone uh, regarding uh, the maintenance of uh, uh, during the winter time in our new subdivisions. Uh, and I noticed that many of our subdivisions uh, are, uh, the signage is not up to say that the street is not maintained by the municipality, but the expectation is when they don't see the signs is that they're expecting the municipality is actually maintaining that. Are we in a situation where we have uh, these fees applied in subdivisions within North Perth that the subdividers or the developers are paying the municipality to uh, plow and, and so on. Uh, and what's the distinction between the two? Because I, I uh, am concerned if, if we are, are uh, undertaking that under, under these fees, that yes, that's our responsibility, but there are those other situations I'm aware of that the subdividers themselves, the developers themselves are paying for that. So how are we distinguishing between the two? Yes, under the subdivision agreements, the developer has a responsibility to maintain safe roads in the winter conditions once there's occupancies. They do have a choice under the agreement to use municipal services or to provide those services themselves. We have both examples in the municipality. We do charge out at these actual rates and these rates would apply to uh, uh, the time and materials that we use to charge out to the subdivisions where we do supply the service. In a subdivision that does not supply an adequate service under the minimum maintenance standard or it's designated as an emergency or not able to pass traffic through the area, the manager of operations or a designate could go in with our plows and open up those areas. Um, and that is for roadways only in those subdivisions and that's the way the subdivision agreements work today and they do have that choice. Uh, further, so if, if there are situations that we're uh, aware of, then perhaps uh, signs, uh, if they're not up, they should be up to ensure that the members of the public know that there is, you know, that distinction between uh, the municipality simply, you know, doing as a, as a matter of our operations uh, versus a situation where the subdivision has not been uh, taken over by the municipality. And I, I'm just not seeing a whole lot of those signs up there, and I know that there, there are situations where they should be, that's all. Yeah, those would be um, 
uh, signage that would show the subdivision is not under assumed by the municipality. I, I would say that we do get calls about conditions on subdivision roadways. We've had less this winter than previous winters. People are almost always aware that it's the developer's responsibility and they're calling to remind or ask us to inspect uh, the condition. And that goes for summer sweeping as well. I'd say as much as winter plowing. And it's these rates that we use to go in and uh, do a cleanup if the developer isn't able to immediately correct the situation. So we use those in both cases. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions of Mr. Couch on this matter? I have a resolution for our consideration that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth proceed to approve the proposed amendments to the public works fees effective March 3rd, 2020. That will be tomorrow. Can I invite a mover? Councillor Seiler, thank you. Seconded by Councillor Richardson. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried with Councillor Duncan's manual vote, indicating that, uh, and there we go, actually it's coming in. All right, uh, that brings us to, uh, you're in, you're okay? Okay, uh, that brings us to item um, six, uh, noting that there's no report from the fire chief on the agenda. Um, there's a bylaw. Oh, there's a bylaw. All right. There certainly is. Okay, so we have a bylaw to go with this as well. Thank you. Uh, the bylaw number 31-2020 being a bylaw to amend bylaw number 160-2015 as amended, Schedule I, be introduced, read, and considered read a first, second, and third time, and be finally passed. And that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and the clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Can I have a mover for that? Councillor Rothwell and Councillor Anstead. Any discussion or debate on the bylaw? <coughs> Let's have the vote. And that is carried as well. Thank you for catching that, um, Deputy Clerk. Appreciate that. Okay, that brings us to um, item six on our agenda. Uh, for item 6.1, councillors, are there any reports you would like to ask of our staff or our committees? Seeing none, that brings us to item seven. We have received no items of correspondence beyond that already shared in the consent agenda for council's disposition. That brings us to item eight on our agenda, which allows council to consider and enact bylaws. We have no further bylaw proposals before us tonight, uh, other than the uh, confirmatory at the end. We're now at item nine on our agenda. Are there any notices of motion from councillors attending this evening? Seeing none, that brings us to item 10 on our agenda. For item 10.1, are there any announcements that would be of benefit to our community or that reflect well on North Perth at this time? Councillor Rothwell. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Through you, I just want to uh, share information that uh, this past weekend, Travis Bannerman, one of our local athletes, uh, won the under-20 uh, men's high jump at the uh, uh, Athletic Ontario Indoor Track and Field down in Toronto. Uh, so he won that with a leap of 1.98 meters, which is extremely high. Uh, not his personal best yet, though. Uh, it's a little bit higher than that. Uh, and he is going uh, on March the 14th uh, down to New York City for the uh, New Balance uh, U.S. Junior Nationals uh, on March the 14th. And we certainly wish him all the best. Thank you for that. On behalf of Council, indeed. I think there's a history of a uh, high jumper in Listless Past and the 1910s that uh, did really well at the Olympics, even if I remember right, there was an Olympic uh, Olympic medals involved in that. Um, Councillor Andreessen. I just have a further announcement. I just want to um, perhaps have Lyndon Couch um, share this information with his staff um, who operate snow removal equipment. I'd like to thank them for all of their work this past weekend. I was on the roads a few times out of need, and um, I, each time I saw um, our plows out in Wallace Township clearing those roads and doing a great job, you know, even, you know, in the worst of conditions, really. So if you could let, thank them on our behalf, I really appreciate it. They did a great job in very difficult conditions. I think a round of applause is appropriate. <laughs> I only, 
I only wish I only wish they covered Linwood. Oh. Uh, item ten point one. Still, uh, other announcements to the benefit of our community. Councillor Johnston. Uh, very pleased to announce that two of our uh, former North Perth students, uh, Caden Cook Nickel from the Atwood area and Ben Rothwell from Britain area, uh, have won in the Ontario Challenge and will be representing Ontario at the Canadian University Engineering Challenge that will be held this weekend at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. They are both fourth year mechanical engineering students at, of course, the best school in the country at University of Guelph. And I'm very pleased to also announce that uh, the one young man, Mr. Rothwell, is my nephew, Lawrence or Alan's son. <laughs> Now, you, you did make some counselors squirm on the claim about the best school, but we'll, we'll let that slide. That wasn't up for debate, though, either. <laughs> it's a good thing. All right. Um, anyone else? Uh, counselor Andreessen, thank you. Uh, I know that um, our CAO, Chris Snell, shared this information, too, but perhaps for the public record, I just want to congratulate the Hoovers on um, being crowned as Elmira's Maple Syrup Festival winners, producers of the year, and uh, certainly as um, part of our agricultural community, we want to celebrate that and uh, make note of our own agricultural producers here in Perth County and, and uh, particularly in maple syrup. So congratulations to them. And uh, it's always good to show up on Myra too. Um, anything else on the agenda tonight? Um, Ms. Gangle, which microphone do you have? Just uh, letting everybody know that Patty Fest 2020 starts Saturday, March 7th, and goes March 7th to the 21st. It's that time of the year. All right. Any, any further on 10.1? Okay, that brings us to agenda item 11. We have uh, no matters to consider in a closed session this evening, uh, so therefore we have no need to report out to the public concerning that. Council as a mandated good practice acts near the end of its meeting agenda to confirm all of its actions and business in its meeting through what is called the confirmatory bylaw. I have the draft of our confirmatory bylaw for tonight, number 32-2020, which reads as follows. And then bylaw number 32-2020 being a bylaw to confirm Generally, previous actions of the Council of the Municipality of North Perth be introduced, read, and considered read a first, second, and third time, and be finally passed, and that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and the Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Can, invite, can I invite a mover? Deputy Mayor Kellum, and seconded by Councillor Richardson. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that's carried, thank you. And uh, councillors, we have completed the deliberation and taken action on the business that has come before us tonight. Before I read a motion to adjourn, is there any other business? Seeing none, I have a re resolution for adjournment that reads as follows, that the council meeting adjourns at 8.47 p.m. to meet again for general council business on Monday, March 9th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Can I have a mover? Councillor Johnston, and seconded by Councillor Seiler. Let's have the vote. Show of hands. All those in favor, and that is carried. This meeting is adjourned.